Arise, shine, for your light has come. With these words from Isaiah, welcome to First Presbyterian Church in Newburgh, North Carolina. Welcome to worship for this, the Sunday that is January 8th, 2023, the day that we celebrate Epiphany. It is good that we are together. My name is Anna Pinckney Strait. I am the pastor here at First Presbyterian, and you are welcome here. I do hope that you'll follow along with our bulletin that you can find on the website. On the website, you can also find our newsletter and so many different announcements. Today, we are beginning a new Sunday school year. There are all new classes available to you. We have several special events coming up on January 22nd in the afternoon. There is a very special organ recital um, by a spectacular organist to celebrate um, the career of Vance Harper Jones, our organist for 45 years who is retiring at the end of January. Um, there is the recital on the afternoon of the 22nd and then during worship, the 11 o'clock worship service on the 29th, we'll be honoring Vance as well as with a reception afterwards. And in today's worship service, um, we will be ordaining and installing our new elders. Um, so I invite you to keep them in prayer. This and so much more is going on in the life of this congregation. So I hope that you will take some time to read and consider the ways God is calling you to be involved. Friends, let us worship God. Please join me in the responsive call to worship. Arise, shine, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord has risen upon you. The brightness of God's light shines upon all the nations. All are welcomed to the brightness of God's dawn. God gathers us from far away and carries us. With radiant eyes, with rejoicing hearts, we receive the abundance God gives. We respond in praise with our gifts, with our very selves, we worship God.
light shines in the darkness and the darkness did not overcome it. When we approach our prayer of confession, we rest in these words and we know that we can approach God honestly, for God meets us where we are with words of mercy. So let us pray. God of love and compassion, you have come into the world and yet we have not recognized you. Forgive our lack of insight and open our eyes to see you here and now that we may receive your grace. Through Jesus our Christ we pray. Amen. Friends, God is for us. And if God is for us, who can be against us? We rest in this and know that by the grace of God, we are all forgiven. Let us receive this good news and commit ourselves to sharing it. And let us mark our commitment to doing just that by proclaiming the summary of the law. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the greatest and the first commandment. And a second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Let us pray. O God of wonder, as that ancient star rose and guided the wise ones, illuminating the place where Jesus was. So now may the light of your Holy Spirit shine in our hearts and minds. As the word is read and proclaimed, guide us again to Christ and direct us in new paths of faithfulness. In Christ we pray. Amen. Our scripture reading for today is the normal scripture reading for Epiphany, Matthew chapter 2, verses 1 through 12. In the time of King Herod, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem asking, Where is this child who has been born King of the Jews? For we observed his star at its rising, and we have come to pay him homage. When King Herod heard this, he was frightened, and all Jerusalem with him. And calling together all of the chief priests and scribes of the people, he inquired of them where the Messiah was to be born. They told him, in Bethlehem of Judea, for so it has been written by the prophet, and you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. For from you shall come a ruler who is to shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod secretly called for the wise men and learned from them the exact time when the star had appeared. Then he sent them to Bethlehem saying, go and search diligently for the child. And when you have found him, bring me word so that I may also go and pay him homage. When they had heard the king, they set out and there ahead of them went the star they had seen at its rising until it stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw that the star had stopped, they were overwhelmed with joy. On entering the house, they saw the child with Mary, his mother, and they knelt down and paid him homage. Then opening their treasure chest, they offered him gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And having been warned in a dream not to return to Herod, they left their country by another road. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. How did they know? It's a question that I've always had, a question I continue to have. Maybe you've asked it too, about the wise men, the wise ones. How did they know? They saw a star, and they knew they needed to follow it. They knew that they had seen Jesus's star at its rising and that they were supposed to follow it. But how did they know? As I've considered this, I've also remembered that people throughout all time have looked to the stars for guidance, looked to the stars for help. Some 60,000 years ago, the Pacific Islands were settled, not accidentally, but intentionally. They were settled precisely 
by people who are using the stars and the wind and the waves, using techniques, techniques that you may have seen in the movie Moana, but come from people called wave listeners or wave pilots. We know that enslaved people were often able to escape with the help of the North Star, a part of a constellation called the Drinking Gourd that led them to freedom. Between 1959 and 1975, part of mandatory training for astronauts was going to the Moorhead Planetarium at the University of North Carolina to learn celestial navigation so that astronauts could pilot their craft, even if the navigation instruments failed. In fact, the Naval Academy, I'm told, still requires potential officers to learn how to navigate using a sextant and the stars. And there's part of the answer for my question. How did they know? The three kings, the wise men, their families, their traveling companions, they didn't just look up at a star and knew what it meant. They were astrologers. The term magi can refer to many things, but most scholars think that in this context, it refers to people who studied the stars, studied the stars to learn from them. They saw in the stars movements and learned things about life that is bigger than them. They were predecessors of our modern day astronomers. How did they know? They studied. Listening to the waves takes time, like astronauts, like naval officers, like people whose freedom depends on it. The wise ones didn't just wake up one morning and know, they worked to make themselves ready. How do we know? How do we know where we are supposed to be, what to believe, what path we are to follow, how to make decisions? How do we know when we can be more effective making change by working within the system or when an injustice is so great we need to take to the streets to shout about it? When do you do more damage for God's vision for the world by causing a scene? And when do you do more good by looking in at the heart of the problem? Where do you get the sustenance to look forward and see possibility, to see hope? How do we make ourselves open? How do we make ourselves open to the stars God places in front of us so that we can be like the wise ones who are willing to journey and travel and leave behind what they know to go where they are led, to be like Moses and go to the place where God abides? It's worth remembering and saying this doesn't just happen in here, of seeing God's stars, learning how to follow God's stars. It doesn't only happen in here, and it doesn't always happen in the ways that we expect. My colleague Heather Shortledge reminds us, Jesus is discovered through the binding together of pagan astrological signs and Jewish biblical promises. How often do we close ourselves off to a divine mystery that pervades and pushes through our lives because it comes packaged in something that we consider to be an unchurchy manner? How do we know? We take time to learn. We take time to develop the skills and the practices and the ability to listen, to be aware of God's greater and deeper and quieter movement within our lives and within our communities. In just a few moments during our offering, some baskets will go out to the congregation that are carrying something that are commonly called star cards. This wasn't originally my idea, but it's something that churches have been doing all over for years. Star cards. On each card is a word. There are approximately some 300 different words in this mix of cards. People don't have to choose the first word that they see. They can put it back and choose another. But you don't always look for the word that you want to find because sometimes a star word has something to teach you. Just a little bit before coming in to tape this sermon, I went ahead and closed my eyes and put my hand in the basket of star cards. And this is the card that I drew. 
a card with a word on it that I'll use in my prayer life in the year ahead. I don't yet know what all it has to teach me. That will be uncovered in the year ahead. Star words aren't the only way to learn what God has in store for us, of course, but they're one way we can start to learn about the stars that God sends our way. As is not unusual at this time of year, because I'm friends on Facebook with a lot of Presbyterians and a lot of Presbyterian ministers, my Facebook feed is full of people talking about star words and reflections on what their star words have meant to them. I read that one woman received joy last year. She shared that her middle name is Joy, but she admits that in the last year she had forgotten her joy. She'd lost her joy. And the star word reminded her throughout the year about the gift of joy in all the circumstances of life, a joy that comes from the simple affirmation that we belong to God. I read about another woman whose star card last year contained the word courage. She was in the midst of cancer treatments when that word was given to her, and she took that star word just on a simple card with her to every doctor appointment. She kept the word by her side as she entered hospice care, and it was with her when she passed from this life to the next. Another person I read about said that she drew the word pregnant. She and her husband laughed and laughed and laughed. And then 11 months later, they welcomed their third child. Sometimes star words can get us into trouble. A man didn't know what to think about healing until he was diagnosed with diabetes later that year. A college student got assurance, which helped her to remember God's love and the love of her congregation during a year when she was far away from home and was dealing with illness in her family. Star words can do many different things, but I think I've been struck most by a story I read about a star word and a woman named Peggy Grant. A couple of years ago, she drew a star word and the word she saw was compassion. And this is what she wrote about it. She says, I thought when I got the word, well, God wants me to be more compassionate. And so I set about praying for compassion with this in mind. At some point during the year, though, she says, I realized that something else was going on. Primarily, this happened through some tremendous examples of compassion that people demonstrated toward me. One Sunday after worshiping here in the church, I was overcome with emotion and feelings of intense sorrow, grief, and loss. I went into the chapel, closed the door, and began to weep as I had never wept before. She says, after a long time, I regained enough composure to open the chapel door, and there I found Cheryl holding the flowers that she had purchased for our worship that day in honor of her mother, and she handed them to me and told me that she sensed that I needed them more than she did. Compassion, she reflected, is not just feeling sorry for someone, but feeling another's sorrow on such a deep level that one is strongly motivated to try and alleviate another person's suffering. Cheryl gave me compassion along with the flowers that day. Peggy Grant began to realize that Jesus was trying to teach her about receiving compassion. And as important as it was, she says, for me to learn compassion towards others, his intention was to burn through the emotional barriers I had erected over many years by offering his compassionate love for me in emotional distress. Peggy says, this was not the gift I had wanted or prayed for, but I kept trying. I kept trying with my star word compassion until this word blessed me. She concluded that some say that it is more blessed to give than receive. I maintain it is more difficult to receive than give. In order to receive Jesus' compassion, we must become vulnerable, admit our neediness, and face our darkness, trusting Jesus to wash our emotional scars with his miraculous love. When you come to draw a star word, and if you are watching on the video, know that you can come by the church office anytime in the next couple of weeks and pick up a star word. 
If you cannot get here in person, we can select one and mail it to you or email an image of it to you. But I ask, what word will you receive and where will it take you? I cannot say that in advance, but I do invite you to take this journey in order that you can take other journeys that God has in store for you. And as we do that, we remember that the star was never the point. The star was the sign. The star word is the thing that can help us to see the thing the star was pointing to all along. As Bishop Curry, the presiding bishop of the Episcopal Church, tweeted, when the three kings return home without informing Herod of Jesus' location, they were no longer following the star. They were following the God who created the stars. And following that God is good for all of us. It is ultimately the point of the star words and prayers and all of that, not that they will be good things or ends unto themselves, but that they will point us to a deeper relationship with the God who created us, the God who redeems us, and the God who sustains us. And we keep this in mind. We keep this goal of the God who created the stars in mind for the elders who will be ordained and installed in our worship, for all that is happening in the life of this community of faith. We remember, we celebrate, we hold dear that we are led by a star in order that we might follow the God of all creation, the Christ of all love, and the spirit of all justice and truth. So, Alleluia. Amen. Friends, as we begin our response to the Word of God, let us affirm what it is that we believe. And today we use words from a brief statement of faith. We trust in God, the Holy Spirit, everywhere the giver and renewer of life. The Spirit justifies us by grace through faith, sets us free to accept ourselves and to love God and neighbor, and binds us together with all believers in the one body of Christ, the Church. The same Spirit who inspired the prophets and apostles rules our faith and life in Christ through Scripture, engages us through the word proclaim, claims us in the waters of baptism, feeds us with the bread of life and the cup of salvation, and calls women and men to all ministries of the church. With believers in every time and place, we rejoice that nothing in life or in death can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. Amen.
As we enter into a time of prayer, I remind you that there are many concerns and celebrations particular to the life of this congregation that we share during our in-person worship services at 8.30 and 11 o'clock on Sundays. If you would like to share in that ministry of prayer, we send out an email on Monday mornings with those prayer concerns and celebrations. To be added to this list, please get in touch with me. Let us pray. Almighty God, you who are the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow, stay with us and love us yesterday, today, and tomorrow through seasons of change, of heartache, of struggle, of love, yesterday, today, and tomorrow, through tears and praise and lament and delight, yesterday, today, and tomorrow. Be who you are forever and always. We long to be made new. We are desperate to leave the past behind us, but you have brought us this far and you have promised to continue. Stories and experiences shape us like ancient stars shape the night sky. So do not teach us to turn our backs on what has been, but to listen for stories of what may be. Teach us not to start over in fear, but to wade in every water and to walk through every wilderness with the patience of hearts that trust you. Teach us not cynicism, but curiosity, so that our souls might sing gratitude and our tongues speak prophecies of your love and glory. For as long as we have breath to give, we want to speak of your love and glory. To you, we pray, the one who is worthy, to you in one whom the angels delight, to you alone at the beginning and the end, we bring to you our prayers and our whole lives this day, and we offer them all in the words you taught. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Friends, as we leave this place, I hope that you will know what it is to follow the star that God has sent. Arise, shine, for your light has come. And as you follow that star, may you be led to follow and be a disciple of the one who created all the stars. Alleluia. Amen.